So I, <clears throat> this all started when uh, the COVID-19 thing came to the United States. Uh, in early March, uh, there started to be a lot of cases and there was talk of a shutdown. And in the middle of March, they just shut down the country pretty much. Uh, and the transportation business just went to next to nothing. All of a sudden, there was no work at all. Well, our banker at Town & Country Bank, he, he knew this. Uh, and he was he was writing a PPP loans, which was the government program, and so you would you would get the money, and if you use it to keep your employees busy, then you wouldn't have to pay it back. So now the question is, what are we going to do? So anyway, since I was always infatuated with the train and, and knew that it needed work, I called uh, Floyd Jernigan, the, the head of the Parks Department, uh, and I said, Hey, Floyd, I've got some manpower that needs something to do. And he said, well, I think the train would be a real good fit for us. And and because, uh, you know, we have the bus lines and some of the work that we would be doing on the train, we do with USA Tours. And so I was really thrilled to have help in restoring and preserving uh, the train pieces here. And so I said, yeah, it sounds great. So we came over here and I knew what the engine was like. You know, you could see it from outside the fence, but it couldn't see in the passenger car. So we had the passenger car and it was pretty rough. We used to give tours. The city had done that for a number of years. We had scout groups and, and other organizations that would from time to time ask to do tours and we would do tours. But it got to the point where the train, particularly the passenger car, deteriorated so uh, bad in terms of being safe that we weren't able to do that anymore. So. And so Floyd says, well, how much material is going to cost? And I said, well, it'd be a couple thousand dollars. Well, in the end, it took more than a couple thousand dollars. As, as, you dug, as we dug into it, we found uh, uh, things deeper and deeper that, that uh, needed, needed fixed. So my idea of the project was kind of, you know, I thought, okay, we're going to go small here. Uh, so we started that initially and and Nick said, well, what do you think about this? And so we we're talking about another part of the restoration inside here. And I said, yeah, I mean, you know, if you guys can do that, that would be great. And one thing led to another. And before you know it, we're, we're into a lot of details on everything from not just doing the floor and the ceiling, but now we're talking about replacing the windows. Roof joists in the, in the passenger cars. Replacing the window shades. Some of the roof studs. Uh, the seating. Some of the metal had to be replaced. Uh, a lot of things. Everything. And um, I, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be a huge project. You know, that's going to take a lot of commitment, a lot of time. And I said, well, I know, but so what? in Nick's vocabulary, can't is not there. We just kept plugging at it and, uh, and uh, eventually we, we won the battle, so. How I came to work on this project is Nick Barrick and I uh, have a, an energy business together and we both love technology and we found that we both love trains. Uh, I was well familiar with this train, played on it when I was a kid. And, um, and so I, I just jumped right in and said, yeah, I, I want to be a part of this. Uh, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to take something that is, has a phenomenal, um, to me, historical perspective uh, of transportation in America. This particular engine was, was built in 1923. The, the the maker's plate is on the on the front of it, and uh, once we cleaned it off, we could read the date on it. And it primarily ran between St. Louis and Springfield, so it operated for close to 30 years. They quit using diesels in the early 50s, so this one was probably taken out of service in 1952, 53, something like that. So we assume that the oil tender is, is about the same age. This engine was built by the uh, by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Pennsylvania. So at the turn of the century from then to the 20s, uh, the, the power and the, it, that was the glory days of steam. And the power and the capacity of these trains to do what they did across America is just phenomenal to me. The passenger car was built in the late 1880s. 
by the Barney Smith Car Company. So it's quite a bit older. So, so I doubt that this engine actually pulled that passenger car, but it, we don't know for sure. You know, it's amazing what people were able to do back then because you didn't have all the power tools that you have today and the process, the computer things that you, you can really save you a lot of time. But uh, today we do things with, with a computer-aided design and, and we have lots of tools to be able to engineer things. And we, we pr still produce some marvelous things. But I think back then of, of putting together a steam engine uh, like 1501 and doing it with pieces of paper and calculations by hand where not only did they craft something from nothing um, and, and dream this up, but it worked. So you really appreciate the workmanship and the detail that went into you know, how they put this together then. And it makes you appreciate then what went into actually getting this back to, to that era. I worked 52 years completely for the railroad, a little over 52 years, uh, from, from November till the next July, over 52 years. I was around trains all my life. I mean, when I was a kid, I'd, I'd walk over to the little piney to go swimming. That's where I learned to swim. And, and uh, there'd be trains going by all the time. We'd see trains. We just took trains for granted. I mean, they were everywhere, you know, on the, I didn't, I didn't live real close to the tracks, but, but you could hear them and smell them all over town. And uh, it, it, we had the, the passenger trains were all pulled by steam engines and uh, well, everything was. And uh, back during the, during the war and when they, when they built Fort Leonard Wood, why the, you couldn't get across the, the, the tracks there. You couldn't get across the crossing. The, I mean, one train would go west and another one would be going east. Crisscrossing across there wouldn't give you a chance to get across hardly. And then in November of 1950, the year I got out of high school, I, uh, my dad said they were hiring firemen, so I went down and got a job as a fireman on the railroad, locomotive fireman. And I worked on engines like these and on this engine too, I'm sure. Yeah, it took me 10 days. I had to, I had to make a, a, a trip on, on every type of engine that we had, that the Frisco had. I'm pretty sure I made student trips on the Fort Wood branch with a fireman that I knew personally. And I made student trips with him on, on this engine. I felt comfortable on it because I'd seen them so much. I'd been around them so much. But I didn't know anything about it, how to, what to do, you know. I had to, had to be shown everything. <laughs> Can I ask how much you made when you started in 1950? Well, in 1950 when I started, I think a, a switch engine paid $11.90 $11 a day. And then a month after I went to work, they got a little raise and it was $12.90 a day. And that was back in 1950. Because we was going to go on strike, and Truman called us a bunch of he called us a bunch of Russians. <laughs> In the early '50s, the uh, railroads were uh, discontinuing use of the steam engine because the the diesel locomotives were a lot easier to run, a lot cheaper to operate. So a lot of cities were were putting in their vote to get a steam engine brought to them at, for their parks. And Rolla did too, in 1955, and that's when they brought it here. And they actually painted it, and it was, it was shiny like it is now. We don't know what the inside of the passenger car looked like then. We don't have any pictures of what, the, what it looked like in 1955, but the outside was, was uh, a nice pretty green. They, uh, obviously, they built the tracks, an extension off the existing tracks over to here, then, then took those tracks out. You said they had tracks? They had to put up. tracks over here mm -hmm. to put it on. Yeah. They brought it down and set it out there on the main track, and then they had the crew build his tracks in here. And, uh, and, and what I've read, they, they pushed it on here with a bulldozer. A 955 Caterpillar. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a 
had a bucket on the front mm -hmm. of it, end loader. They, they tried to, to drive it on using a, a compressed air, uh, and it moved a little bit with compressed air, but they couldn't get it all the way here, so they commandeered a bulldozer from a local construction company, and that's how they, that's how they push it on the tracks here. It used to be on display with no fence around it, and you could come and climb on it and do things, but unfortunately, people have a tendency to vandalize when they have access like that. And so basically they uh, put the fence around it and you could come and stare at it from afar, but it had just uh, sat here and deteriorated for a long, long time until Nick got the idea that it, uh, his crew could replant the thing. It has sat unused for at least 90 years and it sat outside in most of those 90 years and the roof had deteriorated and so it had water in it. And so it, it had suffered a lot of damage. We had to sit back and say, okay, what are we gonna do? You know, do we leave it the way it is now, which was a renovation done, you know, in the early part of the century or do we take it back to what it was uh, when it was built? And so ultimately we decided to go ahead and take it back to, to pretty close to what it was when it was built. All right, so uh, as a kid, I'd always seen this train here in Rolla. I'd been in Rolla my whole life, and I thought it was so neat to go, to go inside this train. Well, one day, Nick goes, Roy, we're going to be working on the train there at Schumann Park. I go, okay. So he comes and gets me. because goes, we need to meet with a guy from the city of Rolla, Floyd Jernigan. We're going to look at the train. We come and look at the train, and we look at it and uh, talk a little bit about what work we're we were going to do on this. And... Next thing you know, the day after, I'm in here more or less uh, gutting the inside of the passenger car. I started with taking out all the seats, took the seats apart, took them to the shop. We took pretty much everything in this car apart down to the walls, pulled the walls apart, had to replace some structure to the walls, rebuilt the walls, rebuilt the ceiling. The ceilings were, parts of it were replaced, parts of it were repaired had some rot from uh, being exposed to the rain. Also, it appeared that maybe this car had caught on fire a few times due to the oil lamps that were hanging from the ceiling for, for lighting. We found old realtor signs that were used to patch holes in the roof. There were several holes in the roof. And then it became restoring everything. Okay, all right, my name is Barry Dunnigan. I'm normally a tour bus driver, a bus 29, and I just drive just a little bit of everybody. Uh, right now, I'm sewing seats. I was tasked, uh, well, Nick found out that I had a sewing machine for somehow, some reason, I don't know how, but he found out I had a sewing machine, so he asked me, did I do some sewing? I called, sure, yes, yes I do. And uh, he said, well, he got some seats that he wanted me to take a look at, and uh, he wanted me to see if I can do some uh, repair on it. I said, okay. Well, one thing led to another. And I said, I can make the whole pattern if you want me to. So I made the pattern. And he said, oh, you did that pretty good. He said, get to sew a little bit. I said, yeah, I sew. So next thing I know, I start uh, sewing uh, some of the, the backs and the seat cushions for the train. 29 uh, seats and 29 backs. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot and I gave him my first uh, demo. Uh, I showed him how, how good my work was, and he said, okay, I want you to do the rest of it, the 28 of them. <laughs> and, and that's what I'm doing now. I went from driving a bus to sewing seats. <laughs> One of the bus drivers said, well, I, I can, I took upholstery in high school, and I've done a little bit of upholstery. I can, I can make seat covers. You get me the material. So I went out to uh, Hobby Lobby, got him some material, and gave him one of the sets of seats. I said, here you go, see what you can do. And a couple of days later, he brought me back a, a real pretty, nicely covered seat. All right, what I'm using is, is a needle with nylon thread. And nylon thread is actually strong enough for me to pull it tight so it can tuck it in. And uh, you actually have to get it into the grooves. Once you sew it in, you just pull it through and that tucks it in. And you take another two inches now this is also a nylon strip that we that have sewn onto the fabric and it's, it's real strong. So it will hold, hold it real tight. 
Um, my name is Rhonda Guff. Most of the time when I'm at USA Tours, I am buying groceries and supplies and getting ready to go on excursions with um, bus trips. And since we're all at home right now, uh, many of us have been asked to help with this project on the train. I think I got the project of making the shades for the windows because I have a sewing machine. So Nick asked me to come to work and bring my sewing machine. It's a lightweight drapery fabric. I did not pick the pattern, but I think it has a very old looking feel. It's in dusty blues and rose colors, um, a big floral pattern. I think it's perfect for um, what might have been the age of the blinds on the train. Much prettier than what they took down. What they took down was more of a plaidish design. And then there's this, there's this piece that has the mechanism that releases it at the bottom. And so our blind will have to fit around this piece. Someone has already cleaned these and polished the brass on them. My name's Marty Eimer. I work for CSE Enterprises as project manager on the construction side. I've worked with my hands all my life. I've been taking the brass parts for the most part and polishing them, cleaning, polishing, and lacquering them. These are the parts for window latches and door latches. It seems like everything on this train is either, either wood, iron, or brass from the 1800s. Well, I didn't have anything to do with taking the brass off. It, it was in buckets when it came to me. And uh, like I said, we've just been uh, uh, cleaning with chemicals and solvents and uh, polishing up, starting with wire brush and getting ourselves all the way to uh, the steel wool, fine steel wool. Well, I like history, and uh, that's uh, got, got my curiosity up when Nick got that project. I just like the, uh, like the old uh, style brass and wood, and I just like to see it done right. And, uh, I hope that's what we're doing. I've made this baker, and I am one of the hostesses on the buses, the tour buses. So I go out on the trips and cook for the passengers, take care of the passengers on the buses. And then they called and asked if we wanted to help restore a train, and here we are. Every joint muscle in my body, this is one of the hardest jobs I think I've ever done because there's just so much repetitive work that you keep, you have to, you know, to have to strip everything down, sand everything down, all the way down to original before you can even go back to painting it. And then you have to clean every piece back up and put everything back together. And so it's just been, at night you go home and you're like, oh my goodness, I think every part of my body hurts. But it's, it's gonna be rewarding come this weekend when we get to see it all together. All right, my name is Winnie, uh, last name's Carol. Normally for this company, I am one of their shuttle drivers, pick up passengers, take them to and from the airport. For the last eight weeks or so, I've been doing pretty much staining polyurethane, which is of course a clear coat on pieces. I mean, you really can't see it. Obviously poly's clear, um, but it's this is what I've been doing so we can get everything kind of done. Make it look really, sh not real shiny, but shiny. Not many people can say, I help, I, I help remodel this, and this is what I've done, and, and, uh, and it's just great with preserving yeah, history. Yeah, you know, preserving history, yeah, she's right. Preserving some sort of history there. It's a beautiful piece of machinery, that's for sure. Somebody did say that 50 years from now, I can say that, but I won't be here 50 years, but still might be, and it's nice to know that I've had a part in it. I mean, I've only been a part of this community down here for four years, so I'm actually enjoying the fact I have a part in something that's going to be so big when the public is actually aware of what we've been doing. It's going to be a, it's going to be a nice thing. Very nice thing.
so this project kind of kept on growing. We kept finding more work that needed to be done or wouldn't it be nice if we could do this or could do that. And somehow we had the expertise within the companies to do everything. As far as setbacks go, we, uh, one of the setbacks was the, the difficulty in grinding off the paint. Uh, when they, we painted the passenger car in the, in the oil tender, uh, they used a very good paint. As far as sticking to the metal, however, it, over the years, part of it quit sticking, it was curling, curling up, and so the only way to make it look good was, was to sand it all the way off, and we had two or three guys that spent three or four weeks doing nothing but grinding. So we did an assessment really of what needed to come down. The paint on the tender was checked and, and cracked so badly down to bare metal that it was rusted. And we decided that we, it would be a lot of work, but we needed to take it down to bare metal in order to, to bring it back and have it last. We didn't want to spend a lot of money putting good paint and a good finish uh, that, that, that wouldn't stand the test of time because of what was under it. So we made the commitment to, to literally grind it to bare metal, but we had guys with sanders and grinders on this for the better part of three weeks. Um, I got to a point where I didn't want to know how much I had left, so I would come in the morning and I would just grind out one square foot, grind the outline, and then grind that out. And then I'd grind another outline and grind another foot. And, and when we were done with that, that's how we did the flat panels. But as you can see on this car, it's got rivet after rivet after rivet, row after row. Well, you couldn't leave the paint around the rivet. So once we were done with all the flat areas, we started with wire wheels on those same grinders and we hand ground around every rivet to get all the paint off that, then prepped it and then primed it and painted it back. The whole engine has been sanded. The whole tender, the coal car, oil car has been sanded and so has this passionate car. Outside it's all been sanded, cleaned, primed, and repainted. We had people who worked on the engine and uh, in the interior of the cab, um, there are windows that are going back in. There, uh, Kent Bagnell did a lot of the handwork and, and put a lot of the striping and lettering back on. Uh, setback, another setback was the seats. You know, there was 26 uh, two-person seats on this, in the passenger car, which we, when we took it out eight weeks ago, they all looked the same to us. You know, they were, they were red and, and a, kind of a dirty gold framework. And, we took it all out, took it back to the shop, and we worked on them uh, for uh, many weeks, cleaning them all up, painting them, sanding and painting them, and refinishing the seats. And, uh, and when it was time to put them back in, uh, we had a couple days scheduled for that. And we went, put them back in, and the first crew put all the frames in, and they found out that the frames all didn't go, they weren't all the same. They, they, each one went in a particular place. And so that took a little bit of time to figure out where they went. Basically, you, you took a frame into the car and you went from spot to spot to spot until you found a place that it fit, that it matched the holes. So we finally got all the frames in. And so then we start bringing the, the seats in, the, the actual cushions, the, bottom, the back and the, and the bottom cushion. Well, they didn't all fit in the same spot either. I mean, we didn't keep track of it. We just assumed it was, they were all the same. So. So that was a real struggle. We ended up uh, quitting about five o'clock that day and said, hey, you know, we gotta, we gotta start this tomorrow. It's not gonna be easy. And so we spent most of the next day just getting the seat backs and doing the same thing, going from position to position to position until we found a place that the seat back would fit.
Well, a while back, uh, my, we had a, a grandkid that was born. He had some difficulty uh, uh, being delivered. And, um, and throughout the time, my, my wife been working with him to develop him a little bit more. And she been showing him some of the things around Rolla. Well, one of the things that was actually, that was, uh, she showed him was the train. He loved the train. And he always wanted to see that train. So when I actually told him I was doing some of the seats for the train, he was all excited and he wanted to see the train again. And this time, not only that we have a, a open book of the train, we have more and more details that he can see. He can see the wood uh, of the train when they sand it down. He can see the walls of the train as they, as they go up and paint. And now he actually can see what I'm doing for the train. So that's something that he will remember the rest of his life. I really do believe it. So, so we've had several companies that have donated to the project. The very first person was the our company was United Rentals because uh, I knew right off the bat we were going to need a, a lift, and so I went out and talked to them and told them what we were doing, and and uh, they said, yeah, we'll, we'll 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 let you have a lift. How long are you going to need it? And I, I said, well, uh, six weeks or so. Or, it's been like ten weeks ago, <laughs> so <laughs> and we're still not finished with it, but they're okay with it. My name is Mark Wynn Miller and I work for CSE Enterprises and my main job there is I work on the electrical crew. When we got into this job we didn't really know how far we were going to have to go to restore the passenger car or what it was going to entail. Well we found a raised panel in there about eight inches wide and then next to the raised panel there would be an opening space about two foot wide and then another raised panel, another opening space, another raised panel, and it went that way the entire length of the train as well. And we couldn't figure out what was in that opening space. So the last piece of steel that we tore down, all the way at the far end, we found a clear story window, which is a window, a decorative window, and it had etched glass in it. And they acted as skylights, basically letting sunlight into the train skylights were a big part you know of giving daylight in there in the train when we started we really didn't think that we were going to have to go this far but once we got into it we really realized to really tell the whole story of the train and bring it back to what it was we needed to restore the clear story windows when it came time to uh to doing the windows uh went to miller glass and and told them what we were doing. We got, there's 30 windows in the passenger car and there's 30 of the etched, etched glass windows. And I asked them about that and they called me back the next day and said, yeah, we'll contribute the windows. The, the seat covers, they end up costing quite a little bit of money, even though we didn't have to send them out. And so I went back to the uh, a banker friend that originally called me to start of this whole thing. And I said, hey, we, we need somebody to, uh, to sponsor these seat covers. And, uh, and he said, well, let me call you back. Well, he called back a couple of days later and says, we're in. You know, we'll, we'll, do, we'll pay for the seat covers. And so and then the, the PPG paint, you know, that there's, there's well over $1,000 worth of paint, maybe $2,000 worth of paint that's been put on this engine. In fact, the, the paint that's on the stencils, where the, the graphics that's on the cars, it's, it's $75 a quart. So it's pretty, pretty expensive paint. Yeah. Two or three or four days would have made a difference. Nick, I, I really honestly believe I'd blame that on this right here. Well, yeah, there's no doubt. So, so one of the setbacks uh, was just a couple of days ago. The wording on the passenger cars says St. Louis and San Francisco uh, Railway Company. And we had searched and searched for a, that letter style, and it was not out there. Nobody had digitized that letter style. It was an old font. And so 
So one of the guys meticulously drew out and cut out a stencil off from a stencil paper. And then I took that and I took a roll of this and I took a steel rule, just like the old school, like you did it in 1890. Yep. And I, and I laid There's it out. It. Yeah, I ruled it and laid it out. And then I took an X-Acto knife and cut it out. 40 minutes a letter. <laughs> a, a, a letter? A letter, 40 minutes. From the start to the finish of measuring and everything and photographing and, and then laying it out and everything, it, it took 40 minutes a letter to do it. <laughs> we put the stencil on uh, Saturday, painted it, uh, it turned out really nice, but we went to pull the stencil off and pulled the paint off behind the stencil. So we, either there was some problem with the, the paint that was done or we, we waited, we were too soon. We didn't wait long enough before we put the stencil on when we, from when we painted the original, originally painted the car. So, so it was pretty ugly. That was kind of a disappointing time because uh, we were all looking forward to seeing the, the wording on the top of the car again. Um, but, you know, we'll, We'll sand it off and take the, the, the stencil that, that Frank had made and we uh, was able to digitize it. So we now we do have the letters digitized and, and so we will have vinyl letters made and put on there so we don't run into the same problem as we had before. Okay, um, do we need this? Hey, I got to tell you, do you need this? We're, already, we're already miles ahead of, of 40 hours of blue vinyl cut by hand. <laughs> that we were trying to lay on, and Nick was saying, "Yeah, just peel that whole thing. Just peel, that whole just peel thing. the whole thing." Yeah, off. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just that easy. I love Nick. I love him. Bless his soul. All right, we're good. How much of the engine holds water? Uh, the the shiny black round part. Uh, so it's actually a shell, like from from like here ish all the way to back here by like the cab is all or it's called the the boiler it has a bunch of what are called flues or a bunch of just copper pipes maybe a couple hundred copper pipes that go through there and so you pump water in and this is the firebox so this is the part that actually has the fire in it um, and actually right here is going to be like the the grate just like on a grill you get all the ash and soot that all comes down here but this is where all the fire happens, and it boils the water and the steam, which then goes through the, uh, through all the copper pipes, and then comes to this big tube right here, which comes right into the cylinders. Oh yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's really, because these are, I have to look it up, like 195 psi or something, something like that, of steam. But this, the black coating is actually just a jacket. And underneath it is going to be insulation because you want to keep the heat in. Um, these are the opposite of cars in that your car, you want a radiator to cool it down so it doesn't overheat. This, you can't get enough heat. <laughs> you just want it to be as hot and keep that heat in. So this black part is actually just a jacket. You can see the, the metal bands that go around it. That's just holding this jacketing on. You can, if you were to take it off, it's like, like fiberglass, stuff like that. Yeah, just, just, just like in your attic. Um, what else do I know I can talk about? Uh, the sideways cylinder, that's the whistle. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a Hancock is the company name. Uh, it's a, called a long bell three chime. Um, I can't remember what the chord is. I want to say like an A minor, something like that. It's a nice, it's a nice three note chord. Why they got to make it nice, I have no idea. Supposedly, if it was a nice tone, it was a passenger engine. If it's scary and like a diminished seventh or something, then it's a freight. I, but I, I don't know, I, I just, that's my favorite whistle. I think it sounds great. The pressurizing the air system, I'm gonna try to find the leaks and try to find the valve that feeds the air to the, to the whistle. Okay. And uh, see if we can make the whistle work.
We want people to have an appreciation and understanding of, of what things were like then in terms of the railroad and the sheer scope of, of the size is, is just alone. If you don't know anything about railroads, if you just come and look at the train itself, the engine and the car um, and the oil tender, you get a real sense of, of kind of that time period. So being here and being a part of it is really humbling to see uh, what they've done and you know, I, looking at the progress and each step of the way and the, and the attention to detail and the, and the pride they took in doing this is, is truly commendable and, it, and it's really a testament to uh, their work and I think the legacy that has further been left behind for future generations and, and we are fortunate in the Parks Department that this is uh, part of uh, our, our uh, legacy as well is that we can uh, provide a home for something like this that was so instrumental in the building of our country. Well, well first let's talk about what I hope happens since we've done the project a year from now or 10 years from now. The, uh, uh, I think, and I think the Parks Department will. I think they'll set up a, a day and a time when this fence will be open. You know, maybe every Friday at noon to closing time or something like that where people can get in. Cause that's what it's all about, you know, getting in. Um, and we made it you know, really clear that we, we don't want to fix up that passenger car and then close and lock the door and that'd be it. You know, if we're, we're gonna do all this work, we want people to see it. And, and of course they agree that they, they feel the same way. So, um, and then it'll be open, um, you know, every school kid before it got so bad that they couldn't really show it off in Raleigh had been on this train before and and so I'm sure they'll continue that, that that all the school kids will come over here for for a little excursion and and go through the train the renovation that we've done we're saying it's going to be good for 50 years uh, uh, at least 50 years now it may need to paint it again but it won't need ground down to the bare metal like we did uh, the passenger car uh, is, is not going to leak anymore so it's not going it's, it's not going to deteriorate due to, to the water damage. Um, now that the seat covers may rot out in 50 years, I don't know. But, uh, no, it would be here for a long time and I'm, I'm really proud to be a, a part of all that, you know. It, uh, this is kind of a once in a lifetime experience. And you don't, all the people that worked on this um, have never worked on a train steam engine before and they're not likely ever will again. Year 2020 is going to be go down as a as a memorable year in history because of the coronavirus and shutting down the country and and all the things that, that uh, shut down the schools and everything that happened and uh, so there'll be a there'll be a plaque around here somewhere that will talk about 2020 and the coronavirus just like there's plaques on a lot of the the national parks that talk about the CCC program and the things that happened in the parks because of, because of that, that funding. And this is a smaller scale, but, but kind of the same thing, just, just a smaller scale. Things like this should not be lost. In a sense, we were willing to put in the effort that the original railroaders did. Um, 
with the same idea of, of uh, we'll just do whatever it takes. And, uh, and, and because it wasn't an easy effort. But, uh, but the end result, I think, is really good and it's gonna last for a long time. This project is about the people who came together for this project, the city, uh, Nick Barrick and, and CSE and USA Tours and, and bus drivers and people who, who take care of buses and maintain buses and all of us who came together. So this project is about this group of people. And, and I, I look at the detail in the trains, but I also look at the detail in the people because that's the real story is all the people that it took to build the railroads and then to operate the railroads. That's the real story.